So nice to see you guys, um, some new faces. I uh, hope that everyone is well tonight. I um, like to start out with just a couple of minutes of quiet meditation, um, setting our motivation and, and just kind of centering ourselves and bringing us to the present moment. So forgive me, I'm just going to kind of move my computer a little bit. Um, if you want to sit in a comfortable position, and most important is that your spine is straight. And bring your attention to the tip of your nostril. And the sensation of air coming in and out. And let's just focus on our breath for a little bit. And if your mind wanders, just gently bring it back. And now that your mind is settled, <clears throat> let's bring to mind our motivation for spending this time together tonight. And we often have lots of different things motivating us, but especially this course, this class on guru devotion implies maybe that we are aspiring for that if we don't already have it which means we probably have some faith in the Buddha Dharma that it can help us and that it could potentially help every living being. And that if we practice and achieve the realizations in our own mind, that we can be a source of that for others. That we could truly help alleviate all the suffering of every living being. Just feel for a minute how wonderful that would be. And so with that, goal in mind with that motivation. Let's go for refuge. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha through the positive potential that I create by listening to these teachings, participating in these teachings, by giving. May I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Sangye chodong soki chognam la changchu bodu dagmi kyapsu chi dagi chenyan gipe sonongi jola penche sangye jupa sho Sangye chodong soki chognam la changchu bodu dagmi kyapsu chi dagi chenyan gipe sonongi so thank you for joining today. Um, you know, last couple of weeks, the, the first week we talked a lot about um, qualities of, 
of a teacher um, and a little bit on the qualities of a disciple. And then last week we talked about the different kinds of teachers, um, eight different kinds of teachers kind of laid out coming from various scriptural sources, but really laid out by um, Alex Burzin. So I, I borrowed from that. Um, and then I thought, you know, this week it would be nice to talk about how we relate to our teachers and, and what those relationships look like, what a healthy relationship looks like. And in doing so, we'll, we will talk a little bit about um, the some of the qualities that, you know, we look for both in a teacher, but then also in ourselves, um, the kind of qualities that we want to, that we actually want to have um, and develop. And darn it, I just clicked on something and I made my screen smaller. I don't know what I did here. Oh, well, I might have to live with that. <laughs> so um, before I start, though, I wanted to just kind of open up um, to see if anybody else had any um, questions or comments or things they wanted to discuss today. Um, ideally, I'd like it to be, you know, interactive for us. Anybody have any, and I don't know what my problem is with the technical difficulties. Actually, forgive me, I'm I'm going to drop and, and rejoin. Hey, my, Bonnie, yes. Bonnie, before you do that, click on any black space. Double click on any black space and see if that expands your screen. Ah, bless you. <laughs> you're You're here for a very good reason. <laughs> uh, sometimes I really need that help. Thank you, Michael, very, very much. Okay, so uh, forgive my little foray into uh, technical difficulties. Anybody have any comments or questions, anything burning? I mean, this this is a pretty heavy topic. So, I, you know, and this is a great avenue to just sort of have a discussion. Um, any thoughts, comments, questions, anything on anything we've covered or anything that you want to talk about before I kind of just launch into something that I've planned in a vacuum? Yes, Michael. I'm one, and maybe you're going to do this tonight or maybe you're saving this for the last week. I don't know if you are, that's fine. Um, but in this, in this world where many of us are doing almost all of our Dharma stuff online, is there a way to actually get a hold of a teacher and, and you know and say is there it, 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 it seems to me like the way I would approach somebody in person if I said hey Bonnie I want you to be my teacher would be very very different than when the only thing that's happening online is I see them when they're teaching and I'm having to uh, um, ask this completely separately and it's almost undoubtedly going to be in like an email yeah yeah so you know obviously there's something really wonderful about <clears throat> you know being in the same space as a teacher i think one thing you know we can consider like what amazing good karma that we all have that this is even an option you know um it, it you know hundreds of years ago uh we have Buddhist masters that were like walking for days, weeks, months, uh, just to be able to hear the teachings once, right? And so in that sense, you could say, oh, they had, they went and they heard these great teachings, but all of the hardship they had to go through and then getting there, and you can only imagine, you know, if there's thousands of disciples and you're in the back row, and this is before there were, you know, microphones and things, right? So, so it was like a mixed karma, I, you know, even probably for many disciples then. Um, what I would say is, I think this is a great avenue for exploring, you know, we talked about like starting the Buddhist path. And one of the things being a, and, and it's interesting because it kind of leads into one what I was going to talk about tonight. You know, this this the qualities of a disciple, the things that we kind of need to develop, one of which is just a baseline sort of understanding. Um, right? Because like, what would be the point of asking someone to be our teacher to guide us to enlightenment, if we don't really understand or have any idea of, of what that path consists of, 
uh, what that what that would look like, right? So so we're all kind of doing our due diligence here online. And then as you spiritually mature and learn more and really it sounds like you have this desire uh, to make that kind of connection with someone, I would say, you know, we talked a little bit and it's funny because I'm later on tonight, I'd like to end with like a meditation where we visualize this person or if they're not, if we don't know who that is, it could be, we could use the Buddha, we could use Jesus, we could use, you know, the, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama in our meditation, but offering the seven limb prayer. So I think, you know, an email or a physical letter is probably a physical letter. I don't know because I'm old fashioned, it feels more, I don't know that actually qualitatively it's any more valuable, but it feels different. And I used to, um, you know, I used to write Lama Zopa Rinpoche letters fairly frequently. Um, and then I would always sort of be concerned about whether or not he got the letter, whether or not he read my letter, whether or not he opened it, whether or not somebody gave it to him. And, you know, first of all, everybody is like doing their best to serve. So I, I got to trust that they're doing that. But in a way, the letter is really for me uh, to actually the action of, of writing the letter and, and praying for guidance and inspiration. Um, and obviously you want that to be acknowledged. Um, and I can't imagine truly any situation where, you know, it wouldn't be acknowledged unless they felt like there was maybe someone else more appropriate for you. But the other thing I'll say is sometimes, um, maybe it's beneficial to stretch ourselves a little bit too. So, you know, when you get to the point where you really feel you want that guru disciple relationship, that's a pretty heavy duty relationship. So I would say if it is a person who exists currently in this world, that to make every effort to try to see them one time, even if it's only the one time would be incredibly good karma. Um, so I would really encourage you to try to do that. And if you don't feel moved to make that effort, you know, it's not, that's okay, but maybe that's a sign that maybe you're not exactly ready, or maybe that relationship isn't the one for you, if that makes any sense. Um, and I realize, you know, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with staying, you know, taking courses online and, and developing your own understanding, developing your own meditation practice and experience of the teachings and checking out the various teachers and like who resonates with me. And then when you feel that like this person is so inspiring that you're convinced that actually it's not even asking them to be your teacher, just that you want to be in the same room and breathe the same air and have the, the great blessing of even one time being in their presence. You know, I think a fire under your butt to do that would probably be a really good sign that that's the, probably the teacher for you and the right time. And I don't know if that's an answer that you want to hear. I think, um, and, and, then, and then the other thing is sometimes we can't do that. Like, so there is also that, you know, um, if we have a teacher who lives in India, there can be very real um, obligations that we have that, preclude us from being able to go and see them or financially, we just cannot make something work. I mean, all of those things are, are, can, can, can happen. And that's why, you know, writing a letter is fine. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately it's how you're viewing them and how you're interacting with them and, and taking teachings from them. So, so I don't know if that, I think it answers your question. Um, yeah. Anybody else? I mean, I, I, I do get it. I, I, I get it. And I, I think even of myself, um, you know, when I met the Dharma, I had the good karma to be living in the Bay Area at the time. And there was a veritable parade of all of Lama Zopa Rinpoche's teachers. So we had some of the, you know, the, the last teachers coming out of Tibet who were still alive coming in and teaching. And that was like good fortune. Um, that was kind of just thrust whatever karmic seeds I created to have that. But it's interesting, you know, um, 
not to get to thinking about it like, oh, you're so great, you know, all oh, the great karma I had to, to end up here. Uh, I always tell this story about not, you know, kind of not thinking too much or too little about where we are spiritually, uh, because it was definitely a blessing. But in terms of that, you know, you never know, are you on the upward trajectory, like you've got a blessing and you're building on it? Or are you on the downward trajectory where you're burning out your good karma, like, oh, I met all these great llamas and now I'm not, you know, I'm not doing what I should be doing. So we never know where we are. Uh, years ago, I went to this, I don't know why this strikes me as apropos to share, but I went to an initiation. I was living in, in the Bay Area and it was a, I don't know if it was a Vietnamese temple, um, might've been a, a, a Thai temple, but this Lama came in and he was doing an initiation like on Chen Rezig or something. And there were like very few of us who were just, you know, white people there and they were playing music and, you know, um, it, in between the, the, where you go and you sort of take some saffron water, they were going out and smoking and eating pork rinds in the in the temple while we're getting the initiation all these things are happening and i so maybe you're getting a theme because i think last time i also talked about my judgmental mind how i was never going to judge anyone and then boom i get it so uh i'm revealing a little bit about my personality i guess Conf in a confessing way but so i remember thinking like wow these people have no idea what we're doing here you know as if i did right but the beauty is, as soon as I thought that, I was like, hey, get real, Bon. You don't know where you are. They could just be starting on the path and they can be like skyrocketing. And I'm sitting here judging them. So maybe that's worse than eating pork rinds or smoking a cigarette, right? <laughs> During the break. So, anyway, all that to say, it was a blessing. It doesn't mean anything, you know, great about me. It's, I need to then you know earn that and it with that comes like a responsibility to like extract the extract the value from those blessings i think we all have that opportunity right so even you know at a dharma class and it doesn't have to be with like a a great lama from tibet it could be honestly here we are today sorry <laughs> it's oh you could have had a v8 but here i am but but extracting the value um, no matter what the Dharma occasion or opportunity is, like fully being present and, and fully um, participating in your own way is extracting the value. And that's creating very powerful uh, causes. Um, that's planting a lot, very powerful karma. So, and that's why we dedicate at the end, because, you know, this is, this is something important. So to that, I would just say, um, keep going keep going to Dharma classes and, and all of that. And then, you know, when you find someone, you'll know. And, um, and it's okay if it's not right away. Yes. Hi, Karen. Uh, apologies if this is in, I haven't gotten ca completely caught up with what you taught. I'm just wondering if, because I asked Geishala this, a similar question last week when we did a Zoom meet and greet, is, is there a difference in the West, when we talk about who is my teacher, because there aren't a lot of, I feel like if you, you know, a lot of my teachers were in Dharamsala in the 60s and, and there were llamas every place, everyone was dropping acid and popping a squat on the grass. And yeah. it's not like that anymore. And I end, and so I've been kind of reaching out going, okay, teacher, how do we in the West define that? Is that, is that, does, they, does he or she have to be a monastic? Is it, I've got a lot of teachers. Are they teachers? So and I, I don't know what how to sort that out. So so actually we did really talk about that last week, but I would refer you, you know, Alex Burzen has, I think, a really great presentation. He has a whole paper on the and I we, I should know the name of it and I don't, so forgive me, but I will try to get that and and maybe share it next week so that everybody has access and you can kind of digest that on your own. But there's different levels of teachers. And the, the level of commitment, so there's an idea of respecting teachers, period. You know, even the teachers who taught us the alphabet, like anyone who's helping us to learn anything. And then because if we're considering ourselves Buddhist, then the most precious thing, right? If we believe in past and future lives, 
then the most precious thing, the only thing we can take with us are, you know, the karmic seeds that we create. So Buddha Dharma helps us to know basically what to do and what not to do uh, in a very simplified presentation. So there's, there's a range of different teachers. We could have, you know, academic professor and we can learn something from that. But then, you know, Dharma instructors, you know, meditation trainers, people who give us vows, Mahayana masters, tantric masters, root guru, all are different levels of teachers. Um, the root guru is really primarily what we're talking about, although we are talking more broadly about teachers in general. Um, you know, we have to be ready to take someone on as a teacher. So it's not just them. And, and I think sometimes a lot of pain and confusion can happen because we get excited and we get enthusiastic and we're inspired. And then, you know, we want to make this big commitment um, without first maybe doing our homework, without first, you know, first of all, am I really a Buddhist? You know, does this, uh, have I have I learned about the path? You know, what is the path? I, I also will share that I thought I was a Buddhist before I knew what it was, which is kind of weird. Uh, because you can't really be one if you don't know what it is. But I, there was some affinity, right? And I think a lot of us have that right out of the gate. Um, but then, you know, taking classes and learning and having respect for those people. But the root guru doesn't have to be a monastic. It doesn't have to be a Tibetan. Um, it doesn't have to be anything. It's a custom job. It's It's the person that appears to us to be the most laden with qualities, the person that we would like to yoke with, the person that we want to become like, emulate. Um, it's interesting because in preparing for the lesson tonight, I, I never took the time to learn Tibetan. Um, and I think if you if you like languages, probably really good to do because they're subtle um, meanings, you know, and, and maybe a, a additional level of understanding you can get when you, you know, have more familiarity with the language. But the Tibetan word is tenpa, um, and that's what we translate as devotion. And so in the West, this idea of devotion can be like just full of a lot of emotional content, right? Like devoted, um, almost neurotically so. Uh, sometimes uh, it can conjure that up. Or um, just, yeah, having having a lot of emotion or, or blind faith. Um, what it means in Tibetan is to want to come close to someone's thoughts and actions. So that's what you're looking, you know, emulation is, is probably a better um, aspiring emulation, you know, might be a better way of, well, who am I to say what a better way to translate something would be when I don't, uh, I don't have familiarity with Tibetan, but, but that's the sense. So it's not blind faith and it's not just an emotional connection. Um, you know, I have met teachers that I felt, quite frankly, they were very charismatic and whatever, you know, I could feel incredibly moved. It wasn't until, you know, I'd been practicing for a while and strangely, it wasn't like, oh, I'm so thrilled that, you know, Lama Zopa Rinpoche is my guru. The realization wasn't like one of thrilled. It was just one of like just recognition about how he functions for me. And so that's another thing is like, um, which I think is important. I was going to talk about it later, but when we talk about the qualities of the guru, you know, th and that's one of the things we're looking for. We're looking for these qualities that because we're not mind readers, we're not omniscient. We can't know for sure. Right. But, but we can impute these qualities onto someone based on, you know, how they appear to us, which, which also is a good reason to take your time. Um, because and and interestingly, not because we're looking to find the self-existent, objectively, universally perfect guru, because <laughs> that there's no such thing as that guru. Taking our time to test our own, not only their qualities and how they appear to us, but our own spiritual maturity to be able to deal with appearances. You know, um what if your guru, you know, we say, imagine the guru as, as the Buddha or the, your, your guru is the Buddha. And so I think that also causes a lot of confusion, um, especially in the West, 
but I think understanding, so this is why it's so great, you know, that to take all these classes and have all these classes online because we can learn, you know, study like valid cognition, you know, Master Dignago or Dharma Kirti talking about what, what is it to be something? You know, what is it to validly cognize something? And um, one of the ways is because it functions in a, as that for a particular audience. And so one of the examples that I just read recently was, and I've heard other examples, which are also really good, but if, a, if you have a watch and you give the watch to the baby and the baby plays with the watch, the watch is a toy. Like it's, a baby can't tell time. It doesn't function as a watch for the baby. <laughs> it functions as a toy. And so then like, which is it? It is validly a watch for the person for whom it functions. And it is validly a toy for the person for whom it functions as a toy, for the being, I would say. Um, Lama Zopa Ramshe has corrected me before for saying person. It's, uh, I don't know, discriminatory. <laughs> We're all about inclusivity, all sentient beings. I got to remind myself. So, so in that sense, now you start thinking about perfect guru and guru as Buddha because they are functioning that way for us. And, and this is a relationship that transcends just this life. So this is a being that you are forging a bond with uh, to get you through the entire Buddhist path, to, to lead you completely to enlightenment. And, and it's not just having warm fuzzies for them, it's really making a commitment. And that's just part of um, you know being a disciple is commitment, right? That's why we take vows. So that's another thing. You know, I would say if you're thinking about having um, a teacher, um, even before you look at um, maybe selecting a root guru, though the person you request vows from may end up being your root guru or could end up being your tantric master, but um, requesting refuge vows, formally taking refuge, um, requesting bodhisattva vows and formally taking bodhisattva vows, those those would be steps that would be appropriate to come even before you ask for a root teacher. So Karen, you unmuted. So did you have a, yeah. no, it's, I got a message saying that you wanted me to unmute. So I was like, just, Oh, <laughs> very weird. <laughs> I know just, it's a strange night. Uh, so, yeah. These are all user error. <laughs> no, thank you very much for that. And I'll check last week's um, video. So I'm caught up and think and, and I did get refuge in Bodhisattva from a Lama, but there were a lot of people there. So I know it there's counts. a karmic connection, but I'm it, not sure if I email him. It know. counts, but that doesn't have to be your, take your time. It's yes. like, you know, you, you, there's a lot of people who are really nice and you want to go out on a date. Maybe you could have a fun time, have a nice dinner, have a laugh or two with a whole bunch of people, but you don't want to marry them. <laughs> Right. And then this is something we're talking about all the way through to enlightenment. So it's good to be discriminating. And and what you're looking for is a person that I, I would say you just you cannot deny their effect on your mind stream. You know, it's not even um, it's almost like that. That effect comes first before you even ask them. It, it, it's like the formality of asking someone to be your teacher comes after you have you've just by default committed to them. Uh, not, I shouldn't say by default, that's misleading, but you, you just recognize um, that they're having that kind of effect on you. Um, so I, I thought to talk a little bit about, you know, what some of the differences, so relating to a guru and what that relationship looks like in terms of like being, uh, you know, a healthy, uh, healthy, productive relationship. So, you know, there, I, I was, again, Alex Burrs, and I was reading this paper, and, you know, he, he talks about the guru-disciple relationship and, like, a therapist and their client relationship, and, and, and how are they different? And I think, you know, this is the things, like, we, we recognize that there's, that we're suffering. We recognize that there's something that we maybe could or do, should do differently, think differently, um, that could, 
help us to be happier people. And that's okay. That's that's that lower kind of motivation. And for a lot of people, maybe that's the first reason someone takes a Buddhist course. They want to be a little less angry, a little more calm, you know, all of that. That's not, doesn't really rise to the level of being a Buddhist, but you can benefit from some of the methods. Um, but when you're looking at like a therapist and a client, you know, a therapist comes in and they're they could be like psychotic. They could need or be on medication. They can be and usually are in a great state of like turmoil. And, and it's good. They're, you know, going for refuge. They're going for refuge to a therapist. Um, a person who's going through that and wants to get help from Dharma, they're going for refuge to the Dharma. But unfortunately, the Dharma really does require you to be in order for it to work right it, it it requires you to have developed yourself a little bit uh to be mentally somewhat healthy so not to be okay we all have our little neurosis maybe or our little quirks but it, there there's some amount of stability that's required um from the side of the of the disciple um and that can be really hard it can be hard to see and hard to hear. Uh, and, you know, a long time ago, and I can't even remember who it was, told me that, you know, Lama Yeshe said the Dharma is for mentally healthy people. Like we want, but then, you know, Rinpoche says, and also, and also true, like the Dharma centers are like emergency rooms. Like we're there to serve and help sentient beings. But with the understanding that unless and until someone has some amount of mental stability and maturity, it's only going to help so much. It's like a Band-Aid, right? Uh, why? Because they can't take the medicine. And that that's the point, right? So the medicine, you know, the Buddha is the doctor. Um, but if you can't take the medicine for whatever reason, there, there's not much the doctor can do, if that makes sense. I, I don't know. I'm not so good with analogies. So, so that's one difference is, is that you have to be mentally healthy. Um, another one, which is interesting, is that when you go to a therapist or a counselor, you want them to like listen to you for one. And then you're talking to them about your personal problems, like your personal life. A, a Dharma teacher, your guru, you know, it, again, it, 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 it's back to this idea of having some spiritual maturity. So like grow ourselves, understand ourselves by using the path, um, by, by following the, the graded path to enlightenment and getting some meditation, some experience, some analysis under our own belts. But it's, it's sort of a waste of a mature student would recognize, not to say that we don't all have time. Sometimes you're desperate. Sometimes you're in pain, something has happened, and you and you would share that with your guru. And that's appropriate. And that's that's they're there to help. But some of the maturity comes like, okay, I'm not gonna ask them. My personal stuff is in a sense kind of trivial, or maybe more appropriate to say, because it never feels trivial, right? Like what's the worst pain in the world? The pain that you're feeling. It's, you know, it's it. We, we could compare constantly, you know, and then, and then hit ourselves because, well, there's people in Gaza and terrible things are happening and all that is true, but it doesn't negate or diminish if we're in pain, what we're feeling, right? So just kind of honoring that pain is pain. And when you're in the midst of it, it's horrible. But to understand that, if we are taking teachings and following the path, they have probably given us already, and certainly if we're at the point of taking a root guru, they have already helped us with a lot of methods, uh, a lot of tools that we have to solve these personal problems. You know, the reality is it's hard to do, it's hard to change. Um, you know, this is why we do so many. I love teaching Lojong because honestly, I just love talking about Lojong because then I get Lojong in my head. And, you know, it's it's super powerful for for helping us. And 
if I have those, then I kind of already know what things I need to do. And it's a question of like, I can't always do it. I'm imperfect. So being gentle with myself about that, but like, do I really think I'm going to go? And this I think is, I think it leads to like sometimes when we are looking for a teacher, we're looking for some mystical person or some like supernatural with some supernatural ability or a miracle cure. Um, and that's not how Dharma works. You, we don't go, you know, you go to an initiation and the next day you're enlightened, you know, uh, you are the deity. It, it, it doesn't work like that. And, um, but I think even mature students, sometimes, you know, we have this thought, like we, we look at the guru and we want them to fix and they can't, what they can do is teach us and be an example of inspiration, showing us that, you know, it can be different. I can be different. That's what a teacher can do for us. So, you know, going to them and, and, and not to say, and, and I will tell you, I will admit that I have. <laughs> I have gone, you know, on a couple of occasions. Uh, typically, I would do it in the guise of how can I help this person, um, which was genuine. But also it was like, how can I help them? Because I'm having a problem uh, dealing with them. And, you know, of course, I need to help them. Really, really need to help me. Like, I need to help myself. And I do know uh, because my teachers have taught me. Um, so, so when we go to our guru, you know, we're taking personal responsibility to apply the methods that they have given us and the tools that they have given us, the tool, the Dharma tools. And you could say, if someone is your root guru, even if they're not the one that taught you the Lojong class that's coming in handy today, it's still them, you know, like they're, they're your root guru. You got that. You understand that it, it, it's still something that you could say they've given you right? Because they are like, they're the Buddha for you. So we're looking at them and we're saying to ourselves, I'm taking responsibility to practice these things and I will fail and I will be sad and I will do things that are not virtuous. And I have to be gentle with myself when all those things happen, when I fail, when I'm wallowing in self-pity, you know, which I, I think until we're enlightened, you know, unless you're superhuman, uh, we have these times. So, but that's, it's inappropriate, you could say, uh, to go to the guru with those things. You can also say, though, the gurus are Buddha. And so if you did, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Uh, so not to sound too much more like what you should, what you should, but these are just self-knowledge. Um, and if we're, you know, thinking about like, okay, how do I, what does this relationship look like? So, the, you know, the, the next thing is like, we're, we're not just looking for someone to help make this life more bearable or more pleasant. Um, you know, when we go to a therapist, it's like, we're there to, I don't know, feel better for now, forever, overcome a particular personal problem. You know, there's a range of reasons. In this case, the whole relationship, the, the results that we expect to get from the relationship is that we expect to get enlightened. And, you know, I was just going to just shoot that out, but I want to pause because that's a huge goal. We, we expect to get enlightened. We expect that this relationship will get us enlightened. That's pretty heavy. And we're taking full responsibility for applying all the methods, all the Dharma methods ourselves. And yet we expect this relationship to function in that way for us. And, and that, you know, I talked a little bit last week about the responsibility of making the guru function for you that way. So it's a little bit of an aside, but I'll say uh, that, you know, say you have something and, and the guru suddenly doesn't appear perfect to you. Then you have to figure out how, what benefit you can get, what teaching you can take from that experience. And then light-handed, 
you know, not like heavily judging someone once you have decided they're your teacher. Uh, and why? Not because they're the self-existent guru that if you diss them, then you're going to, you know, terrible things are going to happen. No, no, no. Because they're the guru that you appointed, <laughs> that you selected. So now you, you, we have to do our due diligence up front and then we have to take responsibility afterwards for how we see them. Um, you know, and that's a whole complicated subject. And, and actually this paper Alex Burzum writes has written, you know, he, he talks extensively about even, you know, there are people who have been abused by their gurus. Um, right. So, so like, what do you, it's not like bashing them and saying it's your fault. It's thank you. You're such a champ. <laughs> so Michael, I think just put a link to it, um, in, in the chat, a link to the paper. It's, it's brilliant. You know, uh, he really, just kind of lays it out. So, but if the, if the guru has um, appearing to make mistakes, then, then it's an opportunity for us to, to just recognize, well, first of all, they must have had or appeared to have had some qualities. So the fact that they function for us for some period of time is, is beneficial. So trying to extract the value from that and then trying to extract like, okay, what have I learned from this experience? You know, what drove me to do not to have boundaries, for example, you know, a healthy relationship, you have boundaries. And it's interesting, because then you'll, you'll read stories of um, real devotion, you know, you'll read like N Master Naropa with his teacher Talopa, you know, who was like, go jump off a cliff. But you know, Talopa was not an ordinary being. So Naropa saw Talopa eat live fish and then snap his fingers and they came back to life. Okay, we can say, yeah, we can, <laughs> with a grain though, with a grain of salt. So, but but if if you see that, if that's the experience that you have, then, you know, how are you going to judge that action? And then it's important to remember also who Naropa was. You know, he was the, the ab, had been the abbot at Nalanda. So, very spiritually evolved. Take care. Thanks for joining. Um, very spiritually evolved beings here, right? So we have to take an inventory of ourselves. Where am I on the path? And is this too much for me? And, and, and take that responsibility. Uh, and then that's, that's ultimate protection. And then you can keep them as your guru, right? Because you're not going to you're not going to allow yourself to be in an abusive situation again things happen though so if if you were to find yourself in that situation there's also methods to like deal with that in terms of again thinking about you know the watch and the toy like how does the guru exist you know it's not it, it's it's okay that not, it's not just okay they're not self existently perfect or Buddhas from their own side. But they could still function for us in that way. So, okay, so yeah, so the expected result of a therapist is, you know, help me with in this life. We're not looking for them to take us to enlightenment. Um, the next thing is, you know, commitment to self transformation. So years ago, I met someone, it wasn't like a romantic thing. And they were they were in therapy for like years. And I remember just one day just asking, like, well, what are the what are the goals? You know, what how do you know if, if it's good, if it's successful therapy? Like, what do you have goals? Have you talked it over with the person? Like, are they accountable? Is there any kind of and of course, you know, the answer was no. Um, and I, I don't know if that's on the therapist or on the on this person. But, you know, having a commitment to transformation and, you know, I, when I was talking to this person, what I saw is they were still struggling with exactly the same things they had been struggling when they started therapy. Now, granted, it can be, but this is not enlightenment they're going for, right? This is, you know, kind of normal things that you would expect to be able to help yourself with. And, and like not taking any assessment of like, am I, am I changing? Maybe it's time to see another therapist, you know, maybe the therapist should recommend that, you know, uh, whatever. But I think having goals. Um, so, so you can go to a therapist and 
And maybe you haven't even defined, maybe you're not committed to changing anything. Maybe you're not committed to evolving. Maybe you want someone to hear you speak and validate you in some way. You know, that's another thing. The guru isn't there to validate us, you know, kind of going back to like, it's not a, you know, not going for like the personal and Michael, I know you're smiling. You've got a whole bunch of experience here. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in the case, in the guru disciple relationship, we're committed to making change and, and transforming ourselves. And, and this is where, you know, talking about vows is really appropriate. Like, that's another indicator that you're committed. Like you're you're taking a vow and taking it seriously, not just going through like some kind of ceremony because you expect a miracle cure. You know, knowing like it's it's more than a marathon. It it's can be multiple, probably is, has been multiple lifetimes. So the, the job isn't going to be instantaneous. Um, and we're going to face obstacles and we're going to be imperfect but we're committing to continuing to try. And if you take Bodhisattva vows, there's a whole bunch of vows and, you know, understanding, knowing what they are is important. Um, and, and, you know, there's always stories and, and I should know who said this, but I think it was Pabanka Rinpoche, you know, like, okay, my, my Bodhisattva vows, I do pretty good. You know, I, I do a pretty good job. Keep my Bodhisattva vows, my tantric vows, I break like rainfall constantly, right? So, so it it's just an indicator that this is not an easy job, but we're not throwing in the towel. We're going to continually uh, recommit ourselves, and and we're not going to do that if we're bashing ourselves when we break vows. That's another thing, you know. Like sometimes we're our own worst enemies because we make a mistake and then we just get so hard on ourselves that we give up. Or, or worse, you know, we decide that's not important. Uh, really good not to do that. I'll just say really good not to do that. So that's another difference is the level of our commitment. You know, we might be paying a therapist money, um, but we're investing our minds um, with, with, our, with our teacher. And then the last is, you know, you go to see a therapist and, you know, you hopefully think that they are mentally together, you know, that they have some degree of mental health. But you don't necessarily want to be like them. You're not, you don't pick a therapist like, I want to be just like, I mean, if you do, that's a weird thing. They could probably make a movie out of it. <laughs> uh, it would be very weird to see your therapist in that way. Um, but with, with your teacher, that is what you're looking for. But but also important that you're not looking, it's not like you're looking to the external, the trivia of their lives, like the incidental things, like the the color of, robes that they wear or the fact that they have a shaved head you know these are all things and you know hey guilty i was a buddhist for like six months and i thought i should shave my head because isn't that what you do isn't that how you show and that, i guess that's another tip off how you show that you have some renunciation or that you're a buddhist so we're not looking to look like them in a external way um and, and by external, I don't even mean physical appearance, although I just mentioned that, you know, like whatever habits they have, the places that they go, the how they eat, they drink butter tea, like all of a sudden we could like take on all these cultural trappings. That's not what we're looking to emulate. Um, and if we are, then, OK, tip off like I don't I'm maybe, you know, I need to develop some more maturity myself as a disciple uh, because what they're there for is to tame my mind. Uh, I want to develop great compassion and I want to develop my uh, meditation, calm abiding, my, my stability, mental stability. And I want to develop wisdom. And those are the things. So I want to be like them. So they have to look like that, right? But we don't go to a therapist like, oh, I want to be just, you know, just like them. It's not what we think. Uh, okay, so I want to pause there because that was a whole lot of me talking. Any thoughts or comments or is, does it make sense? Okay, so uh, 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 
I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I don't know, just some analogies that are not mine because my analogies are never very good. Um, but I think analogies can be really helpful. So uh, Gampopa in um, Precious Ornament for, Re for Liberation gives this analogy like three ways that the guru uh, should be showing up for us or the way that we, how we should be relating to them or why we need them. Um, and, and he makes this analogy like you're going to go on a journey. And, and we've talked about, you know, enlightenment is a journey. <laughs> And obviously, it's there's a path, there's a destination, we're going somewhere. And it's treacherous. Uh, I, you know, even if we were, I, a couple of people I can't see on camera, but you know, even if we're 20, you, we've all experienced like horrible things in life, you know, maybe not devastating, probably someone else has something worse, but you know, life is hard. And, and being on a spiritual path, actually, instead of ultimately makes it easier, but sometimes in the short term, it seems like it's worse. Um, and I don't know if anybody uh, here tonight has had this experience, but it's not uncommon. Like after you start practicing and you start learning and you you feel like your mind has actually degenerated maybe, you know, uh, but what's happening is you're just, you have a different standard and you're paying attention. So like, you know, before being a Buddhist, like just petty judgmental thoughts. I, and I've already, you know, I've given the, this class personal examples, even under the influence of Dharma, even really genuinely striving, I'm judgmental. But, you know, before meeting the Dharma, I was way more judgmental and <laughs> adorable. And I was judgmental all the time about all kinds of things that were petty. And so just you know, noticing that it's not that my mind's gotten worse. It's that suddenly I have a different standard of how I want to be sh not just showing up. I want to say showing up in the world, but it's showing up in my own mind, you know, the, that, that secret place that no one sees. And, you know, sometimes I feel like it's better to, to look bad, but to think correctly. Right. So this is where boundaries, you know, which another, always comes up and has come up even tonight. But, you know, you might not look like the great student. If some other student is like making these huge elaborate offerings or, you know, going to these great lengths to, you know, we talked about going to see a teacher like, oh, okay, so, you know, if you end up bankrupt because you're trying to get to India, uh, hey, that might work for you. But also might happen that you come home and the bills are due and you're under a lot of stress and you like regret it and you're angry that you did it. Right. So that's not where we want to be. So um, anyway, having boundaries. Now I just realize I've gone off the path of this treacherous journey. So we're on the treacherous journey. So we need a navigator. We don't know where how to get to where we're going. We don't know the path. So we're looking for someone who can guide us. Um, and then, you know, we can get guidebooks. We can watch videos on YouTube, but a local, you know, there's nothing like a local telling you how, how, where to go, where to avoid, what the pitfalls are, all of that. So the guru is the navigator for this unknown route that we have. Um, they're providing the information and instructions. And then we want an escort. You know, you don't want to be alone. Like, okay, it's a dangerous journey. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. You know, you want someone to be there with you um, and be there for you and make sure that you don't wander or go astray, uh, which can be so, you know, miss on how, what would that look like in a Dharma context? You know, having a book and then reading it and then not understanding it, you know, like this is the, the difference between having a, a living teacher uh, who can clarify or you can get more information from than just trying to, you know, read a book on our own. I even think something, you know, as, as, as short as like the heart sutra, like honestly, without any commentary, like what, what does that mean? And, and how far could a person go astray? You know, like that nihilistic view, like nothing matters. Oh, everything is empty. So nothing matters. You could go really astray. So, you know, this escort keeps us, you know, they, they keep us safe. They, they stay with us on the journey. 
And the other thing is um, he uses the analogy of an oarsman, right? So, you know, when you're trying to cross a mighty river, so it's, 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 you know, turbulent. If you, if you ever gone, which I have not, but I know a lot of people who've gone rafting on the Colorado or, you know, these big, you want someone who has the strength, who has the energy, who, you know, knows what they're doing and has that fortitude. So this is, this is, a, these are great analogies for, for the guru. And they are taking us on the most important journey and potentially the most treacherous journey, you know, most dangerous. Uh, and why is it dangerous? Because this human life that we have, uh, and, and, you know, I'll just say the words and you can dig in if you haven't heard it before, you can dig in in other places, but it's a precious human rebirth. We have these endowments and leisures that are, that are rare to come by. Like, really dig into that. Dig into how precious and how rare it is. You know, um, these, and again, depending on where you are, grain of salt when you hear about hell realms or whatever. But I would say if, if everything else makes sense, then maybe, you know, maybe they know about this stuff too, right? Um, but there, there's worse situations we could be in. And, and you know, to Today I'm here and I'm thriving. You know, I could go out and get in my car and have an accident and this life over like that. Any of us, you know, we're here tonight. There's there, the world is filled with, uh, well, not filled with the world is empty of people who had plans for today that, that passed yesterday and they're just gone. So really recognizing that. And, and so then like this opportunity that we have, it's like, I mean, that the, the analogies they give, wish-fulfilling jewel, like we wouldn't know what to wish for. We just wouldn't, like we, what we, I heard this joke a long time ago and it's sort of inappropriate, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, like two ants floating on a log of crap and they're like, what do you think about enlightenment? And the other ant says to the one like, or, or I don't know, whatever bug, make it a different bug, make it a bug that would actually float on crap. I don't know if an ant would, but they, you know, he says, I, I don't know about enlightenment. I'm not sure they have any crap there. Right. So like, it's like that. It's like what we think of as so wonderful. It doesn't even, it doesn't come close. And and then, and then that's what we think is wonderful. And then we suffer like, wow. Like there's, there's profound suffering just in this realm of human beings. Forget about hell realms, you know, just in the just in the desire realm that we can see, just animals and humans. It's 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 heartbreaking, you know. We usually just don't if it's not, if we're not broken hearted, we're not looking, we're not acknowledging it, we're not acknowledging even our own situation. Okay, that's a little bit of a tangent. Um, so I, I'm gonna stop there. I had more stuff planned, but I think I rattled on too much. But what I'd like to do now um is is do a brief meditation and i'll tell you what it's what it's going to be just so you kind of know because i i'm not great with leading meditation i was like ah oh, too many words not enough words you know how do you get someone there i am not a skilled meditator um but what i want to do is um you know lead us through imagining the most beautiful place we can imagine um and it's sort of like if you were only on steroids you, you wanted to impress a date. You wanted to take a date to someplace really nice. So just imagine the most beautiful place we can imagine. And then when we're there, and we've created this mental image or, or, you know, some people are not as good with the visual mental stuff, but then maybe just like an emotional, like I'm in a, you know, conviction. I'm in, I've created a beautiful place. This is a beautiful place. And then we're going to call, um, if we have a guru, we can call them, but we can also visualize um, Buddha, Shakyamuni. You could visualize His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, whoever for you appears, and, and they don't have to be a root guru. You don't even have to have a root guru right now. But the embodiment of goodness, the embodiment of wisdom and compassion that you can imagine. It could be Jesus, anybody. And we're going to visualize them in front of us and then we're going to 
offer the seven limbs. We're going to go through the seven steps with them. And then in the end, of course, we're going to ask them to stay. So we will imagine them coming to the top of our head and just melting into light and then sitting in our heart. And from there, you know, merging with our heart, merging with our minds and, and sending that, sitting with that wonderful feeling and, and sending out blessings to everyone else in, you know, all, all 10 directions and all the various realms of existence. So I'm going to kind of get comfortable. Sorry. I sit weirdly on this office chair. So, uh, so now just take a few minutes to build a place like a paradise. and make it as complete as possible. Like if you're able, think of what it would smell like and what temperature the air would be. And then in this beautiful place, invite this holy being to come and join you. And imagine that they are so happy that you have asked them to come. And so just instantly, they're right there in front of you. And don't imagine them to be like flat, you know, flesh and blood. Imagine that they're completely made of light. And they're just smiling at you so happy that you've invited them. And then feel the amazing blessing of being in their presence. Just the humility of being so close And that's a prostration. And you can imagine yourself bowing to them. But it's that feeling of awe. And humility. That's the prostration. And then offer them this beautiful place that you've visualized. And then beyond whatever you think is beautiful, music, flowers, those traditional offerings are for a reason. They're beautiful things to offer a guest. And now 
confess to them something, just share with them something that you're struggling with. Maybe a, a shortcoming you have or something mm -hmm. that you've said or done or thought but that you're not happy with, that you're not proud of. And just bear, bear yourself to them. But then quickly move beyond that to the things that you rejoice in, the little spiritual victories, your practice, your motivation. And just rejoice, rejoice in those things. And then, and then more than that, let's offer all of the rejoicing in all of the Dharma centers, all of the classes that people are taking, all of the teachings that are being given, all the efforts of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, like countless beings moving, moving their minds towards enlightenment. And just feel glad and just share that. And just in the normal world, we share gossip. Here with your teacher, just get into all the great things that you know about and just be glad. The qualities you see in your fellow students or friends, family. And they're so happy to, and they're happy, like happy to be sharing that with you. And then ask them to please teach you, to help you. And Imagine that they are, of course, so happy to help. They've just been waiting for you to ask. And then you can imagine that at their forehead, they have a syllable om, and it's okay if you don't know what that looks like. Just imagine om, white, and there's rays of light and nectar that are coming from their forehead, and melting into your own forehead, and completely blessing your body, providing you with strength and inspiration to be able to act in ways that will help sentient beings to have that energy and those methods. And then imagine at their throat, there's a red ah. And again, it's okay if you don't know what that looks like, but there's red light and nectar and it's coming from their throat and it's melting and dissolving into your own. And it's totally blessing your speech that you'll always know the right thing to say, that your speech will bring comfort and wisdom And then imagine at their heart, there's a blue home. And again, it's radiating rays of light and nectar that touch our own hearts and dissolve into them. 
totally blessing our minds. Wisdom. And now ask them please to stay with you. And so imagine they come to the top of your head, melt into light, getting smaller and smaller. Enter the crown of your head, coming down through your throat, a little bit in front of your spine and melting in your heart level. And just feel the blessing that they want to share all the qualities of their body, speech, and mind with you. They want to inspire you and empower you to help every living being. Now imagine that from the guru at your heart, rays of light are coming through your pores. And that compassion and wisdom is touching every living being that you can imagine. And ask them to always stay there. And then when you're ready, you can um, come back to the room that you're in. And if you're lucky, maybe it feels a little different. And uh, let's dedicate the time that we've spent together um, that all the teachers who teach these methods have long and healthy lives and that all of their wishes become completely fulfilled. And those wishes are to help every living being everywhere all the time. And that we ourselves will attain all the realizations of the path and quickly gain the results so that we too can help every living being. Kewadi Kewokun, Sonam Yeshe Suk Suk Shing, Sonam Yeshe Le Jung Wei, Dampa Kuni Topa Shu. By the goodness of what I've just done, may all beings complete the collection of merit and wisdom, and thus attain the two ultimate bodies that merit and wisdom make. Jung Chub Sam Cho Grimpo Che Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyu Chi Ke Panyam Pa Me Pa Yang Gong Me Gong Du Pa May the precious body mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline but increase forevermore. And then for anyone we know who need prayers specifically right now, just dedicate to them and to the swift return of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to have a long life and all His holy wishes to be completely fulfilled. Gamri rawe korwe jin kam de pendang de wa malu jung we ne chen re zi wan ten sen gyo tsu yi jo pe si de ba du ten gyo chi In the snowy mountain paradise, you're the source of all good and happiness. Powerful ten sen gyo tsu chen re zi, please stay until samsara ends. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your intentions and attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Susie.